Welcome back guys to the Beyond Condition podcast, the voice of bodybuilding and today's voice is a good friend of mine. He's been on the podcast before. Lewis joins us today and you'll be able to tell by the title of the episode that we're going to be talking about things that are of an abusive nature from childhood and you know early adulthood and if this isn't the right time for you to listen that is always okay and maybe you're listening and and maybe you need to to stop the episode or come back to it and just in summary really before we we go into the episode it's actually something we've come together and spoken about big props to our very good friend Sarah who is obviously part of the podcast as well who coaches you and is your best friend she actually yeah. suggested to you as as part of your I guess we could almost call it your your journey of actualization as to what's actually happened in the past and, and where you're going now and, and where you're at. And, you know, she said, why don't you speak to Sarah about this could be something that could really help even one person. And that is the clear message today for anyone that does listen and does resonate. It's always just to, to give a voice. And, you know, we're going to be talking about things that Maybe it feels like what's happened to you, Lewis, is, is worse than, than other people. Or maybe someone resonates completely and it's the same sort of thing. And it's never about, you know, this has happened to me and it's worse than you or anything like that. It's it's actually just to, you know, talk about something that's not maybe discussed as much as it could be, you know? Yeah, definitely. Like, I think, I think most people go through things. And obviously everyone's perspective of bad or trauma um, is very individual, very personal. And for what someone might perceive as traumatic in their life, someone else might be like, oh, that's not too bad. Or, And it goes very much the other way as well. Mm-hmm. And although, obviously, everything has a scale of 1 to 10, maybe in terms of how traumatic something can be or how serious an event was in someone's life, I think to that individual person, if they feel that way, it's always going to be a 10. So in terms of how we deal with these things and how we move on from these things and how we learn to cope with coping mechanisms or even masking, it's very relevant to most people that feel like they've had a level of hardship beyond normality in their lives. Yeah, for sure. I I completely agree with that. I think that it's, and that's sort of the sentiment of, you know, when someone listens and, and maybe they, your experiences they deem as you know oh my god that's so much worse than mine but it's yeah. what your it's your trauma isn't it so as you described there you know something could happen to me and it could be an eight something could happen to you it could be a two someone else it could be off the richter and it is it, it's so unique to you and it's going to be a lot to do with your upbringing your environment your surroundings and also your <coughs> network as well yeah definitely mm, yeah and sometimes the lack of the lack of yeah, yeah. Because of course, things of a traumatic nature, it, it does a lot of the time it feels like you are alone. And even if you have got people that you can talk to, again, it's the severity within yourself. So I could express something that happens, but nobody lives in my head. Nobody yeah. feels the impact of that. And that's why I think conversations like today are really important because it just offers that, you know, especially a podcast, it's very intense at times and, and you're listening and, and you can hear someone describing their story. Now, your story started very early on, actually, when your your dad left and you were very young, weren't you? I was, I was young, I was two, two, I think. Yeah, two years old when I left, mm-hmm. when he left. Um, and it's weird because I can actually remember, I can remember that I remember talking to my mum about it once and she was like, well, you were only a baby, you wouldn't have remembered. And I could actually relay the events of that day, the argument where the argument happened, how it happened, what we did as a family after. Like my mum took us to her friends two doors up the road straight after. My mum was like, "How can you remember that?" Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? You were barely walking. Let I mean, I couldn't remember anything else about that age at all, really. Obviously, like you have like certain reminiscences of things, and you're like, "Oh yeah, I can't even remember living in that house," or. Yeah. I remember when my room was decorated like that, but such a specific event as well. And I think from a very, very early age, I was always very much a daddy's boy. Okay. Um, look, dad, my dad, look, he was my hero, which kind of ironic in some ways because he was very hard on me. And the way we were brought up, it was very... My dad was never abusive, but it was tough. 
like I remember saying, look, I remember like my nan always comes back to a story like when my dad had left, he couldn't go near the house because it upset him seeing my mum. Mm. It was very much her decision from what we were told and what we can remember in certain arguments as we were growing up and things like that. And my nan was carrying, because my nan always tells me the story, my nan was carrying my brother, who was younger than me, and my sister, who she was walking as well, who's two years older than me. And they were both crying. Like, we want daddy to come home. You know, we miss daddy. Like, why is daddy not coming with us? That sort of thing. And I'm just there skipping up the road, like, smile on my face, playing with, like, the little action figure I was carrying or whatever. She's like, are you all right, Lewis? I was like, yeah, nan. And she's like, cool. Do you understand what's going on? I was like, yeah, but big boys don't cry. Mm-hmm. And even at that young age, I mean, I was, what, three years old? Mm-hmm. At that young age, it was already, I think, like I just said to you before we went on like recording, like people would see that as emotional regulation mm-hmm. and it's actually suppression. And that was very much my childhood at that age. And growing up, it was like, you don't show emotion. Um, emotions are weakness. And whatever you do, always strive to do better. And it was never a case of, I don't think he ever intended it to be like, you're not good enough. Yeah. But it very much becomes of like, whatever I do, this is not good enough. Like, what can I do to be good enough? Again, like, apart from, apart from when he told us my granddad had died, when again, I'm probably four or five years old, never had a hug. I cannot remember in my life having a hug off my dad. Um, same goes for my mum. Um, single digits in terms of age. The last time I can physically remember having a hug off my mum. I think I kind of gave her a sarcastic pat on the back at my wedding when I got married. But yeah, it was just never that kind of a childhood. I mean, we were loved in a way. Like, we were loved. We were very loved. But it was always like a case of do better. Mm. With my dad, do better. Oh, you got an A. Why didn't you get an A star? Oh, you got into a fight at school. Did you win? No. Next week when you come round, I want to hear that you won. Yeah. yeah. It was very much like a case of you keep going until you do better. And then when you've done better, celebrate it for five minutes. By the time you get to me, you best be telling me what you're going to do to make it better again. Mm. And I think as an adult, I respect it. Yeah. But as a child, like, what do I do? Like my dad. Never told me he was proud. And you sit there as a... And I don't think you acknowledge it as a child that much. You just carry on and you plod along and whatever. But as I got into my teens and as I got into, like, early adulthood, and even now I'm like, what the fuck? Like, all I ever wanted was that. Like, did it hurt you? Would it have hurt you that much to say those two words? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm proud. No. And obviously, my mum was a single mum. We were naughty, like, my sister was, like, the golden girl. But, like, we were naughty children. And, again, it's like there was very little much time for celebration, mm. especially during primary school. Like, academically, I'm quite clever, so I did quite well. Mm-hmm. But it was overshadowed by the fact that I was also a little shit with it. Yeah, yeah. Put me in the classroom, yeah, great. Put me in the playground, put me out in the road playing Kirby or whatever we were playing over night time. I was the one that would cause trouble. I think the first time the police came to my house when I was seven years old. So I was just that little knobhead. Wow. Um, yeah, and it was just the case. I mean, that was... Someone had took my ball off me. A neighbour took the ball off me because we were using a no-balls games sign as a basketball target. And she'd come out. And t- so I just tried kicking the door off. And I was just... And again, like, is it just a... Is it just a mischievous child or... Is it suppression or is it anything else? It's just like, well, I just want my ball back. I just want my ball back. And, you know, like, we were naughty. And even things like, I remember once a guy come round and, like, I, I dread to think what social services would do now. Um, sat there in a uniform. And, you know, the dog catchers on the pole? Yeah. It was clearly someone from the RSPCA looking back now. <laughs> But it's like, who's this man? We were sat in the neighbour's living room. Who's this man? He's from the children's home. Oh, okay. And it's like, that, those were the levels that it had to go to to control us. Like, there was a lot of... 
is it discipline or violence? I suppose the contrast becomes the level of which you have to take that discipline before it becomes violence. Yeah. Like now, like we wouldn't have been kept in that home. Um, and again, look, I don't hold it against my mum. Look, I love my mum, like, dearly. Um, and I appreciate why she did what she did at times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it was very much, like I say, it was very much a case of there was no pride in what we did or there was no sense of achievement in childhood. It was either do better or get hit. It was one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think going into teenagers, early adolescence, like, it just... <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't even know how to look. Like, it just made me a certain way. I was very much, I wouldn't say I was a loner in terms of lack of friends, mm -hmm. but I was very much just like not part of the crowd. Like in um, right yeah, look, I was the I was the little goss. Like, I was the only goss in the school. Like, I just, well, if I'm going to stand out or if I'm going to be made to feel this way, like, I'm going to stand out in my own way. This is my way of rebellion, you know? Well, if I'm not a good enough son, Dad, well, look at my black nail varnish. Doesn't this look good? Yeah. You know, like that sort of thing. Um, and even on like the music, like I was very much into Marilyn Manson and stuff like that. It's very anti-authority, anti-establishment and very shocked to the system. Mm -mm. And like, my mum kind of embraced it. She loved the fact that I was different. Um, my dad, although he was a punk rocker when he was that age back in the 70s, my dad was very much all, just looked like a fucking idiot. Can't you fucking dress properly? Yeah. But here we go again. Not good enough. Yeah. Um, and that was childhood, really. Like I say, it was tough. But we were poor. Like we were that group of like we didn't have the designer shoes and stuff. Like we were the ones with the cheap shoes from like Bacon's, as it was then. As if you remember, like the nineties equivalent of shoe zone. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we were that family. Um. And that was it, really. And I think it kind of just led me into that mind frame of, well, this isn't good enough. I think that's, at the time, I didn't acknowledge it mm -hmm. as much as I thought. I, did. I think subconsciously I acknowledged it more than I did, mm -hmm. um, consciously. But it never really shaped too much about me. I never let it dwell on me. I never let it, I was just like, oh, here we go again. Or, mm -hmm. you know, what's the point? And that was it. Yeah. Um, being, like, obviously being a goth, I struggled to make a lot of friends. Mm. And I had friends that like, I got on with for whatever reason because I sat in them in the in classroom and they knew I wasn't a complete weirdo. I was just another like, a lad that dressed differently. Acting up a bit. But um, outside of school, it set me apart. Mm. Like, we lived on a council estate. It was rough. Um, it was very, although it wasn't a word then, it was very chavvy. Mm -hmm. mm. And I was picked apart quite a lot. And it's like I said to you on the call, like, obviously, like, we were disciplined quite a lot as a child, like, as children. So I'm like, well, I'm used to being hit. So you're just another person my age. Like, I'm used to being hit by adults. Like, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that led me into kind of, like, fighting a lot as a young teenager and stuff, where it got to the point where I wouldn't be allowed out on my own because I'd just get into trouble or, you know, it was problems were coming back to the house. It was affecting my little brother because he couldn't go out of the house and... That so where's your older brother, this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like got to the point where summer holidays, find yourself a job. You're not going out, so be productive, find yourself a job. Um, and I got like a part-time job, just pot washing in the kitchen. And at that point, like my friends from primary school had kind of drifted off into their own little groups. And I was at a secondary school that was a few miles back away from the house. So like catchment areas weren't really a thing back then. Okay, yeah. so a lot of my friends lived two, three buses away and we couldn't afford bus fare. So it wasn't a case of going out and meeting friends and stuff. It was more very much like a case of, well, I'll just find a job in a local pub. Mm -hmm. And it was actually the pub where my mum worked. And there was a couple of people in the kitchen where I did pot washing that were like, oh, you're into Marilyn Manson. Oh, we're into Marilyn Manson. We're into this music. We're into that music. We're into piercings. We're into tattoos. I was like, oh, cool. Well, what time are you working till? Do you want to come and listen to some music later? Yeah, why not? And it was weird because, like, I was, what, 13, 12 years old at this point? Just sure. about to turn 13. Yeah, I was still a kid. And I just thought, this is cool. I'd go into school, like, I'm hanging out with 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds. 
I can have a drink because I don't tell my mom. I can have a cigarette. I don't tell my mom. I had a spliff the other day. I didn't tell my mom. And it was like a very much a sense of security that I'd never had before. Yeah. Because ev- everything was praised. Oh, you're a good kid. Oh, that's cool. You know, I could play guitar. Oh, I started learning guitar. So it's like, oh, that was really good. Play this song, play that song. And I'd learn songs and I'd go around there and I'd play on one of their guitars. And it was always very much appraisal. And I was like, this is so different. Like, I've never had this before. Mm-hmm. And I like, developed a sense of attachment to these people. Like, I dreaded going back to school. Yeah. So I'm going I'm to lose this now. And I didn't want to, so I started playing truant and I started skipping school and I'd go around and they'd be like, no, you can't do that. Come on, like, we're like, you know, we need to look after you. Like, you've got a good future ahead of you. You're smart. Like, your grades are good. Go back to school. And it very much built, like, a trust up that I'd never had in other people because, like, they actually genuinely want the best for me. Mm. Um, and then I met a girl and I was like, she was into the band music. I was like, can she come around? Yeah, of course you can bring around and stuff. And we started going around. And over time, I wouldn't say behaviour changed dramatically, but the mood changed. It became very much a case of I'm a kid to now I'm one of them. Um, Didn't appear sinister at the time, didn't appear malicious or anything like that. And I was 13 years old at the time, and they were like, have you had sex? No. I'm a kid. Maybe you should. Why? Because we're telling you to. Okay. What do I do? And um, they took us both, like, they said, oh, go upstairs, there's a bedroom upstairs and stuff like that. And they just kind of ushered us into a room and we're like, what do we do? But we knew what to do. Like, we knew the the physics of it, if you know what I mean, but it's like, what, like, in the terms of the situation, like, what do we do? Like, are we ready for this or whatever? And then one of them came in and like, you both still dressed. And in the end, we just did it and we just went out and they were like, did you do it? Have a drink, have a spliff. And that was it. And I was just like, well, okay, don't know really what to make of that. And we just left. And it became a thing, like, we started going around every weekend. So obviously we'd be at school in the week and stuff like that. Um, but every Saturday, I'd come home from my dad's. So I'd be like, Mum, I'm going out. And she'd be like, well, where are you going? Well, shut up. Like, you don't tell me what to do. And I'd just walk out the front door as a typical teenager would. Because, yeah. again, look at that, in those days, like, it's different. It's a different world back then. Like, cool. you know, it's, kids didn't have that fear. Like, the, I think is a, upon the world now. And like, we went back, like, it was a couple of weeks after, I think, and it was just, like, the same again. Um, but this time, people stayed in the room. And we're like, why? Like, that's weird. Like, just, like, childish innocence. Like, well, that's weird. Why? Just, just do as you're told. And, yeah, and it was. it just went like that then. And that became, like, how it happened every time. Like, every time we went round. They started intercepting us on the way to school, doing, you know, just, you're not going to school today, you're coming to house, but we need to go to school. You said, like, well, fuck what we said. This is what we're saying now. Get in the car. So we did. And then the girl I was with, she kind of just, like, you could see it was changing her. Yeah. Um, And she just wasn't good at all. And... I remember texting her the one day, I was like, there's no reply. Mm. I was like, that's weird. Well, she always replies. Nothing all day. Left school, rang her, voicemail. Nothing. Left her a voicemail. A week or so went by and I bumped into like a mutual friend of ours. And they were like, her parents have moved her away. Look, we don't know why. Um, her parents have moved her away. And the whole family had moved away. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, okay. And I never heard of her again. Wow. And obviously we didn't have social media back then, so you couldn't just hop on Instagram and be like, I'm going to search this person, or I've been blocked, like I've done something wrong. Mm. Just nothing. And I went back round on the weekend again, and they were like, oh, where's she gone? Well, she's not here anymore. 
And I was, I was upset about it at the time and stuff like this. is like my first girlfriend. Like, I thought my world had ended at that point. Um, and they were like, well, okay. And then I was like, these people were like, I, think, like, I don't think there was one that I could remember that was under 20. Mm. <clears throat> and one of the girls was like, well, you'd have to do it with me then. And I'm like, but you're a grown up. So get upstairs. And I was like, this is weird. And like, I struggled with the situation. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't fancy her. Like, it's just not. I mean, people say, like, oh, you men can just sleep with anyone. Mm-hmm. Look, can you really? Look, if you don't want to, you don't want to. For sure. Um, in that sense. And it was just like, yeah, so then it progressed to there. And I was just like, I don't want to do this. Well, do you want to get beat up? No, I'm a kid. Like, I'm not going to stand a chance. Get upstairs. Um, And that progressed then, and the girls would swap. And, you know, like, most lads at like, that age, you th- in the moment, you think, oh, look, you know, all the like, teenage lads are like, oh, I want to lose my virginity and stuff like that. But I think deep down, everyone wants to do it in a certain way. Yeah. Or at least with a girl they fancy or someone they like at least. Um, and you'd think it would be a guy's dream in some senses. Yeah. Or a teenage lad's dream, should I say. But I was just like, this is horrible. Um, and it was just something that I just struggled with generally. And every time I said, oh, I don't want to do this again or whatever, it would either be, well, okay, sit down, have a drink. And then I'd be drunk, but then I'd be upstairs. Yeah. Have a spliff. But then it was three or four spliffs rather than just half. And then I'd be upstairs. And the one time, like, it, again, it changed. Like, the girls went upstairs. Like, I got took up. And then the guys came in as well, as they always did. It was like this time they started, like, masturbating and stuff. I'm like... Why? Well, what are you doing? This is weird. Mm. Trying to get beat up. And the one time I said, well, I don't care. Well, I actually don't care. Um, so they took me into the bathroom, filled the bath up with water, and they would literally hold my head under the water, pull me out. You can do as you're told. No. Head back under the water. Um, look, even to now, look, I, can't, I, can't stand under, I can't stand under water. I can't swim underwater. Well, I can, but look, I learned to swim look, as a young at a younger age. But now, water on my face in look, that form, even standing under a shower, um, won't happen. If I get if I jump in a swimming pool and I get splashed in the face, look, I lose my shit. Yeah. Um, to the point where like, I won't go swimming now. Um, unless I know it's going to be quiet or. It's very controlled, and it's like I know who I'm with. If that makes sense, and there's no kids around, or I won't go in up at family time. Yeah. And again, you know, <clears throat> that progressed again. And the one time I was having sex with the one girl, and I was just like, "I'm finished." And I thought nothing of it. I was just like, well, "That's that done." Um. And one of the guys turned around and said, "Well, I'm glad you are." I was like, what do you mean? Well, I'm not. I was like, okay. So that's your fault. Make it right. And I'm just like, what do you mean, make it right? So you're going to make it right. Um, And that's when it really changed. But like, the worst. Um, They started getting involved then. Um... And yeah, it just, what it was basically, I felt like, I think at that point I'd realised from the point of working in the pub up until where I was at now, like it was just a well, a well done Peter of ring. Yeah. That's what you'd call it now, I suppose. Um, and that carried on for two years, three years. Yeah. Um, it's like whatever they wanted to do, they would do. 
Um, and it was very much a case of, well, every time I tried to pull out, well, I'll tell my mum. So the next time we were in the pub, one of the girls stood up and was like, do you know your brother sleeps, uh, your son sleeps with us? My mum was like, well, he better not really does. He's a right dirty little boy. So I went home and my mum was like, are you really like, are you using protection? Well, I was like, mum, it's not like that. Lewis, you just, you're a teenage boy, don't tell me it's not like that. So there's that avenue of like there's that avenue of support gun, because at that point, like, why would they stand up in a pub and openly admit that mm -hmm. to my mum if they are doing wrong? It was just like, well, I can't go to my mum. Couldn't go to my dad. Just felt like I could never go to my dad for emotional support. Yeah. And I try and walk away again. You don't want to do that. I mean, look, I've got cigarette burn scars on my arms where they put cigarettes out on me, all sorts. And, like, I'd get beat up. Like, they'd kick me to the point where I couldn't get, like, you know, being a boy, you just walk around in your shorts at home. Couldn't do that because I'd be covered in bruises. Um, and even to the point where, like, I was like, I'm not coming back. I don't care what you can kill me for all I care. Yeah. That's fine. You've got a brother, haven't you? I mean, you've got a little brother. Yeah. Don't come back. He will. Mm. When do you want me? Yeah. Um, and then that carried on until I was basically just at their disposal. So it was just before I turned 16. And I went down there like I always did because like, there was just times that I went down there, whether it be a Saturday evening or one day in the week. Or, and I went down on Saturday evening, I remember it quite specifically. And it was very much like, what are you doing here? I'm here, look, I'm always told to come here. Fuck off. And I was just like, what do you mean, fuck off? So like, fuck off, we don't want to see you anymore. And I was just like, why? And they were like, Look, at this point, I was actually upset. It was like, <clears throat> I remember speaking to um, Andrew Keeler, who did a lot of, like, not so long ago, he did a lot of like, life coaching with me and stuff. And he was like, it's a trauma bond. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I've become so attached to this situation. Yeah. Um, that, like, I felt like it was like, a positive part of my life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, like, these were people that had done, like, anything that you could think to me. And it was just like, why don't you want me here? Like, what, look, why don't you love me? Yeah. And they're like, we're just like, fucking about, like, fuck off. Horrible little kid. I just shut the door. And I'm like, I'm literally stood outside this house of these people. And I'm like, why am I not good enough? Yeah. Like, again, like, why am I not good enough? Mm. Like, I'm not good enough for my dad. Like, my dad's not proud. My mum's not proud. Like, I'm part of this horrible little thing. And, like, even they don't think I'm good enough. Mm. My girlfriend, my first girlfriend, left without a word. Like, why am I not good enough for anyone? And, <laughs> like, even at that point, like, it kind of, like, that set the mood then. Yeah. Was, like, this is who I am. I'm not good enough. Um, went to therapy, like, and anyone that knows me on a personal, like, I despise therapy. Because all you're doing is regurgitating shit. And I'm not saying all therapists are crap, but therapy is crap. Like, don't sit there and tell me, like, oh, it will be okay, and let's talk about this every week for two, three years, and it will, like, it doesn't get better. Because for all the therapists I went through, not one of them made me feel like I was good enough. All you're doing is reminding me that I'm not. Um, and then, like, <clears throat> I drank a lot. I did a lot of drugs. Ended up, I ended up being a doorman. I had a few dead-end jobs. Ended up being a doorman, which was fine because even if trouble started, it's like, well, I, I know that happened. Like, I'm not good enough anyway. Who would care if I died? Yeah, yeah. Well, no one would care. Um... So if there was a fight, I'd be like, let's go, because what's the worst? What, are going to kill me? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't do worse than what they did. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, beat me up. Look, like, cool. Look, like, like, at this point, I've got nothing to be afraid of. 
got with relationships, like self sabotage was like a massive thing. Even if like you know, like it was okay, I'd be like, but I'm not good enough, am I? I'm not good enough for you. So just leave. Mm-hmm. Or if you tell me I'm good enough, I'm going to create a situation where you tell me you hate me or you're angry with me to confirm to me that I'm not good enough so you can leave. And then one girl, I was with one girl for like three years. Um, and I was quite overweight at this point. I was like just a fat drinker. Mm-hmm. And um, she cheated on me. She had an affair. Well, she had an affair. And again, like, I'm sat there, like, this doesn't, look like, even after three years, like, this doesn't look that bad. I'm just like, well, I'm not good enough anyway. Like, you've just confirmed it. Like, thank you. But why? Look at you, you fat. You're disgusting. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Bye. And that's kind of what got me into bodybuilding, really. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, just joined the gym at that point. I was like, well... Uh, this was like where it started to change a little bit. I was like, well, I'm going to show you that I can be different. Mm-hmm. But next time you see me, I'm going to have abs. Like... <laughs> How a lot of men start, I will get abs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they, breakups do make bodybuilders. But in the same breath, toxicity never stops. So I met my future wife at the time. Um, we got married. Everything was great. But again the same patterns would re- reoccur. Mm-hmm. And I found, like, a pattern in all of my relationships. Like, this is, like, over years. Like, mm-hmm. not just one relationship, this is every relationship. Doesn't matter, like, how good someone is, how well they treat me, like, I will sabotage. Mm-hmm. If someone's horrible, marry me. Like, if someone's a bitch, marry me. Like, because you, you've just made me feel like I'm at home anyway. Um, but if it was good, well, I need to sabotage this. And you always get kind-hearted people that understand. And they're like, we know you had a trouble. Like I said to you, like, no one really knows about my child. Yeah. Like, but they know that like, there was something. Mm-hmm. So they'd be understanding. And it was very much a case of, look, we understand, like, some people, like, some like, professionals suggested I had BPD. So people are looking to BPD. You know, there was the whole point of being, like, you know, sociopath, like, whatever, like, however you want to, like, whatever title or term you want to give it. Like, I was just like, just, no, like, I, I'm not that way. It's like, I'm not depressed. I don't need tablets. Like, I know what's wrong. I just can't fix it. And even then, and this is where it became a problem because I'd be like, well, even with sex, like, people talk about making love, like, yeah, good for you. Like, what's that? Because my relationship with sex was so fucked, basically, from my shoulder to my teenagers. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to do. But for, as far as emotional attachment goes, like, no. There is no emotional attachment with me for sex at that point. And it's like, well, I need to sabotage this relationship now. They won't argue with me because they understand. If I'm in a mood, they'll just be like, oh, if you use space, they'll understand. If I slam doors or punch walls, well, okay, well, we can can fix it. And it's like, well, what can I do now? Mm -hmm. What can I do? And it got to the point where... What makes me feel the worst? Being back in that position. Now, you can't go out and ask to be abused. It doesn't work like that. That's not abuse, then it's consensual. And it's like, I'm look, I'm very comfortable with my sexuality anyway. I'm like, I'm a straight guy. It's like, there's no, you know, it didn't affect me in that way. Mm. But so it's it's not like I could even go and do something like that because it's just not me. So be like, well, the only other taboo thing I can do where sex is concerned is infidelity. So I would go and cheat, and I would lie there as I was cheating or just after cheating, be like, I oh, know I shouldn't have done that. This is a very conscious decision. It's got nothing to do with the girl. Mm-hmm. This is just a very conscious decision because now I feel uncomfortable. Now this is 
there's the attachment to sex, there's the attachment to uncomfortableness. But now I'm home. Mm-hmm. And I can go back and be like, I've done this. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I'm leaving you. I know you're not because I'm not good enough. And however much I loved that girl or thought I loved that girl at the time, I'd get in the car and I'd drive off and I'd be like, you deserve this. Mm. Good. Now I'm home. And I spent my whole life at that point just creating situations where I felt uncomfortable because now I'm home. Yeah. If I was happy, I was uncomfortable. You could be like the best thing that ever happened to me. You will not make me happy because I want to be uncomfortable. I want to look, it's almost like I wanted to suffer. Um, and it just checked, like it just got worse over time. Um, even if like I'd had a bad day at work or, you know, whatever else, and that wasn't an option, I'd be in a mood all night, go to bed. Are you okay? No, I'm not. Would you want to cuddle? No. Treat me like shit. And it just became that toxic that I couldn't even have a normal sex life where I wouldn't be like, treat me like shit. Mm. Look, hurt me. Do whatever you have to. I don't care how horrible you have to be. I don't care what you have to do. Just make me feel like shit. To the point where I'd I'd have sex with someone and I'd be like, I'd be phys- phys- visually upset. By the time it was done, and it was just like, this is my life. Um, and it got to a point where I was in, like, my last serious relationship, really, and the same behaviours were occurring. And at some point, everyone has to admit, like, you are the problem. Um, and the same behaviours had, like, you know, the infidelity was worse than ever. Um, and I was like. I can't keep blaming other people. Mm. And it gets to the point where you have to take responsibility for your own actions, no matter how traumatic the events are that lead up to that event or how how traumatic, you know, whatever happens to you is that shapes you. At some point, you have to take that accountability. Mm. Um, Which is when I got in touch with Andy, and I was just like, you know. And he started working with me, like, even, like, looking back with friendships, like, I've had friends for years, like, they were just, like, horrible to me. And I'd have people be like, why are you friends with them when they speak to you like that? Mm. Home. This is home. You know, like, I've spoke to you before, like, I was coached by Christian Chapman, mm. a great guy, and because he's such a nice person, I walked away from his coaching after a couple of months. Look, I couldn't even give him, obviously, a proper explanation because, well, I'd have to tell him everything and that just wasn't the case Look, where I'd be in a position to do that. And it's just because you made me feel so comfortable. Right, yeah. So, obviously, I went to Dan, and although Dan's a nice guy as well, Dan also understands the, the hierarchy of, like, you know, we talked about daddy issues and stuff like that on my consultation. And he got the memo mm-hmm. when it comes to, like do better. Mm -hmm. And he just generated that respect from day one. And I've had other coaches in the past, like who have understood that, but with Dan Lockett really clicked more. So I remember I was going for a deadlift once and um, I'd I'd set, I'd hit the numbers that he was setting me weekly. And he was like, this week I want you to really jump the weight up, but we're going to drop the reps down to like powerlifting reps. And he just turned around to me. And I don't think he knew the connotation of it at the time. If you don't get this lift, don't come home. Um, and I didn't get the lift. And I remember I literally sat in my car crying after. So I was just like, that's how much, like, at that point I sort of started to realise how much it affected me. Yeah, yeah. Um, because when I train, like, I've always done posts about emotional lifting and stuff. Like, it's always been a big factor in my lifting. Put a certain song on, like, the, the post I did on Instagram, just, like, you listen to the lyrics, you can see why it's so attached. I'm so attached yeah. to that song. I, I felt that. Yeah, and like I say, like my behaviour carried on escalating. I started like doing, like having the odd conversation with Andy at this point, <clears throat> and like just because of my finances at the time, like I wasn't in a position to really do anything about it, so I just carried on. And it got to Christmas last year where everything was at boiling point. Like I had a girl at home who like thought the world of me, 
I was, you know, up and down the country, like just being a dickhead, basically. Um, and it was Christmas, and I was juggling all of these lies. And at this point, I thought, look, I'm fucked. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm going to lose everything, and I can't do anything but blame myself now. Um, went into the gym on Boxing Day, and look, I just knew my world was crashing around, crashing down. And I was like, I feel like naturally, I'm going to feel uncomfortable. And Dan had took me off the deadlift protocol and he'd put me on like a, a diff different hip hinge variation. And I just went back through my messages. I was like, what was that number? And I, look, I found the numbers that he'd set that one week. And I just sent him the video saying, could I, look, I did it. I got three reps with, I think it was like 250 kilo. Bloody hell. <laughs> I know. And I was like, can I come home? And he was just like, yeah. Um, just mad you can sit there and talk about all these like you can talk about being raped and stuff and like you can sit there cold but then these little things and it's just like what the fuck look he wouldn't have had a clue yeah. he'd have just sat there with Romana probably on Boxing Day and been like oh fair play to him lift. It's, it's a shit dead lift by my standards but fair <laughs> play to him exactly. Dan's got a good lift yeah and like but at that point I was just like it's not good enough. Mm. And I think that's when I realised I had a problem. Like, I've just chased something. Someone's told me I couldn't come home and I'm like, this isn't good enough anymore. And obviously, like, so I got Christmas out of the way. Like, I started speaking to Andy. And, like, I mean, fair play to me. Like, he changed my perspective on so many things. I wouldn't say I'm a better person for it, but I'm, I'm a better understanding person of myself for it. But again, it's weird because like through other events that happened, like everything came out. And I was sat there with this partner at the time. Like she was obviously heartbroken and devastated. And it was weird because I was like, but I've done all this work with Andy, like I'm so much better in myself. And like I'd put like I'd showed her like, my behaviour had changed, like I was that guy where I'd be like, there's my phone, use it. Whereas before, like I couldn't have. But I was always trying to prove myself. Because the trust was gone, and it gets to a point like I'm home, mm. and then you acknowledge you're home because you're so uncomfortable. Mm. And it's like I watched, I saw a reel. I can't remember who it was, and it's like the self sabotage. Your last self sabotage is always the worst. I hear you. But you need to have the worst to literally. Be like, this is fucked. And yeah, that's kind of like, at that point, I just decided I needed to change. But in terms of like, would I change what happened? No. If I could, would I take back a single attack? No. Um, if it wasn't me, it would have been someone else. There were more before and after because the police did get involved um, and arrests were made. Oh, okay. Um, not by my court. Look, again, we were just raised never to talk to the police. Yeah. So I just stayed out of that, which I don't hold guilt over it. It's just the mindset I had at the time. Um, and I don't think I'd have wanted to have stand, stood up in court and relived it in that manner. But I think there's certain things, and this is like what Andy taught me, you have to learn what you've been through shapes you regardless, and it doesn't have to be negative all the time. Like a lot of negative behaviour came from it. Yeah. But looking back now where I'd say, I'd say I'm 85% of the way there. It's like, like the condition I get in when I'm on prep. Like... Why, Lewis? Like, how do you, like, I love to suffer. Yeah. Do you love to suffer? Because no one loves to suffer. If I love to suffer, I wouldn't have sat here crying about what I've cried about. Mm -hmm. But when it gets hard, are you just better at dealing with hard things than everyone else is? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people have to take away from it, really. It's like whatever you've been through, um, how can you make it positive? 
And this is where um, it goes into bodybuilding, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, with me, and yeah. obviously not you as well, like, that's our outlet. It's like, would being raped as a child ever be positive? No. Not in the black and white of it. But what you learn from that, I think it can. Um, do you like to suffer? No. Can you deal with hard things? Well, yeah, because that involuntary pain that I went through as a child or as an adolescent, however you want to term it, now when I have voluntary pain, when there's pain that I choose to put myself through, don't come at me, bro. Yeah. Like, I've said to you before, like, you can, people will hurt me, you know, they will, they can attack me, like, I'll sit there upset, I'll sit there and cry if I have to, or, or will you break me? No, you won't. But you can't, like, at some point, I'm going to come back. Mm -hmm. And I think people misunderstand, like, forget sometimes, like, when they've been through trauma. Like, if you're sat here telling the story, whether it's to your friends, like, on a podcast, or just sat there in your own thoughts, if you've sat there, you've come back. So what can you, what can't you do? You tell me if, like, especially something as serious as rape, like, would you know yourself? If you can come back that just to be sat there today, what can't you come back from? Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's like insufferable in some way. But if that doesn't break you to the point of like you end your life, what what's what's worse? You say to any person, what's the worst crime on the planet? That is. Yeah. I've I've I've, I've surpassed that. But, I've beat the final boss, if that's how you want to put it. Like, break me. You can't. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people need to understand. And nothing, nothing worth having is easy anyway. Like, I know it's a cliche. Like, use what your life taught you, as bad as it is, use it to be better. Yeah. Like, you can overcome whatever you want if you really want to overcome it. And sometimes you have no choice. Mm -hmm. But I don't think sometimes, I think this is where people let themselves sit back and get comfortable. It's like, yeah, at that point, you didn't have a choice but to be okay. Mm -hmm. But now you have a choice whether to win. And if your trauma is the fuel or your why to prove someone wrong or to prove to yourself that you can, that puts you on a stairmaster and you know, makes you sprint for an hour or... When prep gets hard, it's like, no, that, this is my determination, this is my motivation, this is the source of my discipline. Like, now you're winning and you're better equipped than 90% of the people that you're against to deal with that hardship. Because guaranteed, you won't see me sitting on Instagram being like, oh, I'm on poverty calories. But you won't. Yeah, same. Like, yeah, I'll put like, oh, 20 minutes cardio today, 30 minutes cardio today. You'll never see him be put, cardio's killing me, it's too long. Never. Like, do it. Like, use, use your, like, I wouldn't even call it pain. Mm. Because, yeah, it hurts. And, like, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't have sat here and got upset at points, like, if it didn't hurt. But in the same breath, like, it's never going to hurt as much. So keep going. Like, you're stronger than you think you're always stronger than you think yeah, yeah. and people need to understand that and remember that about it so like I've got that thing like, with the, the Simba motif on the back of some of my, my coaching clothes like remember who you are mm. like and you can look at it both ways like remember it like you're the child that overcame whatever it is you overcame and you're the child that's grown into an adult whether you're a happy, like happily married a successful career person, a parent, like you've come from whatever you've come from to be who you are now. But also, like I'd even say to you now, like if you could go back to like ten year old Sarah, what would you say to her? It's gonna be okay. So sat here now, like why would you look at a stairmaster or why would you look at eight hundred calories and blog? I'm not I'm not okay on this. Like, you just wouldn't, like, and it walks out into any walks of life, like, it's going to be okay. Like, you know it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, as far as, like, 
reoccurring memories and stuff. Like, would you know if you had children, would you let anyone harm your children? No, you wouldn't. Would you let would you let someone come and harm you physically now? Like, it's not a matter of whether they could overpower you or not, but would you stand there and take it? No, you wouldn't. It's very different. So why would you let them mentally abuse you still? Yeah, yeah. Like, you wouldn't. Like, why allow? Like, like, if you wouldn't allow it physically, if you wouldn't protect your own skin or whatever in that same manner, why are you still letting them torment you now? And I think that's one of the biggest things that Andy taught me. This, this, this part, like it's huge because I feel like. This is it, the way you just said that. And, and like you say, coming from Andy, he's obviously a life coach, so he has a, a good way of putting things and it does stick with you. But it's certainly, you know, as well, when we look at this type of talk around the internal, w what we go through and what we're thinking day to day, it's like an extension of that as well, which I've certainly learned probably more so recently, I'd say, even over the last year, two years, is that if there's things that trigger a certain Sarah, <laughs> the one that I don't particularly want to bleed into my normal life, I actually acknowledge them and I understand why. And I, I allow myself to be okay with that. You know, like that discomfort you've described today, there's certain yeah. things isn't there, you know, that, and people have let me down or friendships I've poured everything into and they fucked off and stuff like that. It's like, I can't get angry with stuff like that anymore because I just don't, I haven't got it in me. You know, it, it's just like, it's okay. <laughs> See, I think with me, it's very much a part of who I am. Mm. Like, are there triggers? Like I've said to you before, I couldn't watch a film yeah. with like child abuse in it. I could watch a documentary because someone's done it for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me how it's entertainment. Makes it's sense. Not, yeah. like, um, look, I did psychology at A level as well, so I'm like, if you're someone that's sat there writing about these things, why are you trying to? What are you trying to portray or mask from yourself? Well, like, I just I overthink things too much. Yeah. Um, like, can I have like that song? So I say, like, on that post, like, it's a trigger. Mm -hmm. And I know if I've got a set where so like, this is all in, can I put a certain song on? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, give me my daffodil and a song like that. Oh, come on, Fox. <laughs> like, you're building favorite. No, but like, this is it, and like, it was um. It was only a few weeks or a couple of months ago with Sarah. She put um, hit thrusts in my plan. And I was like, I'm going to try it on the Smith machine because I don't get on with the like the north of the smooth drive that we've got in the gym. And I got like seven or eight reps. And I was like, this is a shit way. It's only three plates of five. Like, Fuck this. And the week after, oh, I got hold of some Modafinil. Like, and, um, not endorsing drug use, obviously. <laughs> and, uh, I thought, Fuck it. Like, I like, I've been told to try 100 milligrams. I was like, no, nah, I'm going to do two. I'm, I'm stupid like that. And I put I put a song on. Um and it was um oh, more chemical romance. Um Welcome to the Black Parade, because obviously it talks about your dad and like and I was like, I love it, it's Modafinil. And like I think the week before I've got seven reps and I banged out about eighteen. But to the point where like this is where you need to learn to control it because I literally finished the set and I had to walk out the gym. Yeah. And my my session was done. I was, it's my second exercise and my session was done. Yeah. But in terms of having trigger points and things like that, I wouldn't say mine is as boxed off as that. Like I'll always make the joke about like releasing the inner child and whatever. Like he's got a good lot. Like, he's got a good little deadlift in him. Or you know that that post I did the other week where we spoke about like in my school uniform was like the smallest smile can hide the biggest pain. But I bet he's got a good deadlift in him and stuff like that. Like, I think it has its purposes, but if you don't acknowledge it in daily life, you're going to keep making the same mistakes. Yeah. Especially if you're as toxic as a person as I've become. Mm -hmm. um, like, I'm in a relationship now, and I'm so happy. Because, yeah, she's great, but I'm. it's, it's about me. Yeah. Because now I don't feel the need to be uncomfortable in life to be happy. I've just learned just to sit back and be happy. And although I still chase that uncomfort in certain things, and I do have moments where I'm not sure I'll start an argument. No, you <laughs> it's like, fuck off. No, but this is me being honest. Look, I do. I still have these moments where I'm like, that's, that's like, annoyed me. Look, 
0.01%, but I could make that 20% if I want to. Yeah. And I have to be conscious of that. But then in the same breath, like if you're in a partner with, if you're with your partner in your house, like I know if someone broke into your house, you'd feel 100% safe. Yeah. But Matt could do with them. But you, like I'd be that guy and it's like I know if I've got that trigger point or I want to be protective because I'm quite a protective person anyway um, in my own right. Like it, trauma sometimes it's a blessing mm-hmm. because of certain situations in life where you're just like, I've got this. And you know, like yourself, but you said, like, you know, you've been through relationships where a problem is a problem, whereas now it's a problem shared is a problem halved. Yeah. I know I'm well equipped to deal with that problem mm-hmm. because when it gets hard, I know I'm better at hard things. And look, I say, look, even if you flip it on the other way around when it comes to bodybuilding, learn to deal with voluntary pain mm-hmm. and get through it. When involuntary pain does come along, when you lose someone or whatever, it doesn't make it easier in a sense, but you're still going to have that emotional attachment to losing someone. Mm-hmm. But you're so much better equipped to deal with it. Look, embrace embrace the shitness within you, basically. Mm, it like, does. It we've is, all got it. Yeah, yeah. Like, it is It's certainly... You know, when you look at what can come from bodybuilding when you are really pushing it, you know, the extremes in off season or in a prep or everything in between. Um, Matt used to always say to me, like, I don't I don't know how you do it. Like I, I've never seen someone do it like this. And I'd always done it myself. Like I was from a town that no there was like one other female bodybuilder, like no one knew about it. And I was so unhappy in my personal life that I, I I just did, right, to the nth degree. And that's where I think that we probably share, you know, yeah. it, it is a choice. Like there's, when I was, and, and similar to your sort of thought process, nothing's going to hurt me that bad. Mine is when I was homeless as, as a 14-year-old, nothing yeah. will ever match eating out of a bin and walking around the streets at night thinking, is this it, you know? Nothing, nothing in bodybuilding will ever match that. So it's like, I'm grateful for this hardship and I do truly believe that it's from that. Yeah. And that's what I mean. It's like to come from that to where you are now. Mm. Just there's, there's you can't have dark with you can't have light without dark. Yeah. You can't because then it's it's not light anymore. So you have to believe that no matter how much you're suffering in that moment, mm. it's always gonna get better. For sure. But sometimes the more you suffer the greater, the better is. Mm-hmm. And if you translate that into bodybuilding, the harder you work and the worse you feel, yeah. the better your chances are at getting first. Yeah. So, like, the more you want to put into it, and I think that's what that situation teaches you. Like, people could listen to our story and be like, well, mine was worse than the bravo to you. Mm-hmm. But then some people would be like, oh, that was, that's horrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I'll, I'll take pride in what I've become. It's took me 20 years to get here and there are a lot of people that don't like me because of how I've been for the last 20 years. And Mm -hmm. It's weird in a way, like, because I don't feel guilty. Um, I'm sorry. Am I sorry? I wouldn't have done it going back. I wish I could have changed earlier. But I can't change who what, look, I can't change what I've become. Look, I became a monster within myself, really. Um, look, I wasn't a nice person at times, mm. but only you can acknowledge that as a person. You could be told a thousand times, like, oh, you're a bitch, you're this, you're that. Look, unless you actually acknowledge it yourself, it's irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Look, I don't care what people think. Look, you know that from what I've like, with conversations with the past. Look, unless you're on my list of like people that, oh, if you die tomorrow, you're going to change my life. I can't give a flying fuck what you think. Yes. Um, and I think that's what that's what made this podcast so easy. Like there'd be so many people or voices spoke about that or oh look at look he was bummed as ball, whatever, or however you want to pull it, whether you want to mock me or attack me, I really don't give a fuck what you think. Mm-hmm. Um like you wouldn't look ninety nine percent of people wouldn't get through it and be confident in the way that I'm confident and stuff like that. And look it, it does have its negatives, like clients will come to me sometimes, they'll be like, Oh, I can't do this. Oh fuck off. <laughs> I'm quite blunt at times really? for that to rein it in as a coach. I'm like, you don't know what suffering is. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Look, a client will say to me, oh, I'm starving. And I'll just send them a picture of a kid from Somalia and be like, that's starving. 
we have spoken about this before. There is there is elements of that though, and again, I think that's probably down to. I've done it on posts. Like it's why I'm so like like people say it's because sometimes like, and I'm I'm very I hold back on my posts. Like, I don't think I'd be cancelled if I posted what I wanted to post. So, like, Fan. <laughs> I would. I'd be cancelled, but like it's me. And have I got a lot of friends? No, I haven't. Do I care? Not particular. But in the same breath, like, like your vibe attracts your tribe. Like, I know we've spoke about that, like, a massive amount as well. And, you know, like, I embrace every part of me. And I think sometimes, like, when you unveil certain, veil certain things, people are like, oh, oh, okay. That makes sense now. Like, and that's, I remember, like, talking to Sarah and we were just talking about, like, that last relationship breaking down and stuff at the time. And it was very much at a time when I was just coming to terms, not coming to terms with the breakup, I was coming to terms with myself. Yeah. And she was like, well, to be fair, I've got flex. Look, if I was your girlfriend, I'd have kicked you in the balls and told you to go suck a dick myself. And it was at that point I opened up to her. Yeah. And she was like, hold on, did they know this? I was like, yeah. I'd have never left your side. Mm. And I think that's a lot. Obviously, like, Sarah's like a fucking legend anyway. Like, it's why she's one of my best friends. Like, But when people start to see the complexities behind you as a person, like, it opens doors to be like, okay, now we understand. Now we can take something from that. Look, look, do I want, look, I don't want sympathy. Look, to me, because that makes me a victim and I'm not a fucking victim. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, in look, the dictionary definition, yeah, I was as an adolescent. Yeah. But like, again, like I've said already on this podcast, like, would I change it? No, I wouldn't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'd go back and ask for more, not because like, I enjoyed it, but like, if I could take what I'm taking now from that experience, I'd be even stronger. Mm-hmm. Like, cool, come at me. Like, and I think people generally just need to, it's like it's a very snowflakey generation as well. But look, it does get better. It will always be better. But it's on you to make it better. No one's going to do it for no therapist, no life coach. Even with Andy, he'll be like, right, and tell me everything that happened in the first phone call that we had or the first video call we had. I literally sat there in tears, pouring everything out. And it was like, okay, we're never going to talk about that again. Nice, nice. I was like, okay, what's the point of this then? He's like, well, this is what you've learned. He wrote down his notes as I was like, pouring my heart out to him. And he was like, you like to suffer. No, you don't. You're better than everyone else out. This is what makes you feel uncomfortable. Well, how can we make this better in terms of how can we translate this into your relationship? How can we translate this into your coaching business? How can we translate this into your bodybuilding? And Andy had actually, previous to life coaching, Andy had coached me as a bodybuilder before as well. Because mm-hmm. he was like, obviously... Um, a bodybuilding coach before he progressed into life, like more life coaching, and obviously now full time life coaching. And he like he knew me anyway, and even for him, he was like, makes sense now, because no matter what he told me, I was just like, yeah, okay. And I've had coaches before, like they've tried to break me. I'm like, no, you can't. Even Dan, Dan did it. He was like, look, I said to him, like, some of the long lines of not, no one's ever filled me up. No one's ever made me full with food. And he was like, right, a post workout, 250 grams of dry white white rice. <laughs> Dan. And like, obviously my calories allowed for it at the time. Like, I needed that food. And I remember I did legs with him. Was it legs? Yeah, it was like a, ham, like a posterior session with him at the grow room in Gloucester. He was like, you bought your post workout? Or are you driving back? I was like, no, I've got it with me. And I bought literally this massive Tupperware of just like, cooked white rice it must have been about a kilo of cooked rice and it was like what's your post workout again I was like 250 grams of dry white rice 220 grams of chicken ketchup and I just sat there and I ate it and he's like you're not going to finish that I felt like shit (laughs) (laughs) you're not you're not going to break me you will not break me (laughs) this is the thing as well with bodybuilding I think that you know, certainly for me, because after our call before, you know, arranging the pod, I had thought processes, as you do after speaking with with someone, one of your people, someone you trust. And, and I was thinking, you know, I think certainly for me, 
there's so much from the journey that you know when i step on stage i'm so fucking proud of myself for fucking getting there from being as you've you've picked up from being where i was when i was 14 to stand on a fucking stage half naked i'm like i'm gonna have it like yes i want to win i want to fucking win i'm there to win if i don't win someone's better than me i fucking crack on and i've always had that mindset you know post show is difficult but it's like i'm so happy to to be able to fucking do this thing you know like and and that's i think probably where we both can struggle a bit to understand you know the moaning about being hungry the moaning about various other things and it's like But but look at what we get to do, you know? Yeah, It's fucking cool. no. I mean, like, even talk, talking about prep, like this year I prepped. Um, I'd booked my shows. I'd booked, like, I'd done my, my entry, my registration for PCI and stuff like that. Um, four or five weeks out, maybe longer, six. I was like, I did, I'd, I'd sent my checking pictures and I'd done, like, my um, abs and thighs. Like, there's a lump on my lap. Like, it's just hair on my lap. I said to my coach, what the fuck? And it was like, keep an eye on it. Kept an eye on it for a week, got bigger. Went to the doctors, weren't interested. Oh, you take, you take steroids, we're not interested in you. Okay, went to another doctor, have some antibiotics, went to a private doctor. They could have given you stronger antibiotics. And it got to the point where it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I was like, I need to go to hospital. Went to hospital. We need to cut you open. Okay, what? Well, well, we need to cut it open. It's fluidy. We need to drain you, but then you're going to have to have a drain. For how long? A couple of weeks. Now I've got a show. See you later. I'll just go double my antibiotics. You know, more drugs, always a good option. It's And uh, similar. it got to the point where it's like, I can't get on stage like this anyway. Oh, But yeah, obviously. I was 17 weeks into a prep. Yeah. And I was just like, well, I've done all of this. Like, what the fuck? And um, I stood in the kitchen at my ex, now ex's house. And obviously, like, she'd found out everything that I'd done in our relationship. And obviously, this has happened. And I just, I was like, am I such a bad person? I don't deserve this. I've worked so hard. And she just looked at me and went, you deserve everything you've got. Okay. I'm going to go. I left. Went to hospital. What's the procedure? Well, we need to cut you open. We can put a drain in. I want stitches. Well, we can't stitch it up because if it re reoccurs, like there's going to be an empty hole inside you, like infection. If it's stitched, we can't monitor it. We need to pack you. Stitches. Look, I'm the patient. I'm in charge. I want stitches. At this point, I was like a week and a half, two weeks out uh, from what would have been my shows. And I was like, well, I can't do the shows. I'm going to book a photo shoot. So I phoned up Matt Thomas. I was like, I want to do a photo shoot. This is the gym where I want to do it. Can you accommodate? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. This is the situation. Do a photo shoot. I just basically do every pose where you can't see that part of my um, my body. He was like, yeah, we'll make it work. So I go into hospital. I'm in hospital for four days. I'm put under general anaesthetic. Um, you know, like, can't go anywhere. Did I have a day where I didn't have a meal that was on my plan? No. Phone my mom every morning. Right, I need 60 grams of oats, 40 grams of whey, 10 grams of peanut butter, 20 grams of peanut butter, whatever it is. Bottom one <laughs> in separate tubs. Meal two and three, chicken and salad. Bring them. Bring a pack of dark chocolate. My last meal is mince and rice. Could you cook this much mince, this much rice, put it in a tub, put some like paprika in there so it's not a bag of crap. My last meal, bring me a tub of Greek yogurt, bring me my scales, bring me some like fresh raspberries or blueberries or whatever. Didn't miss a meal. In hospital. The nurses were like, obviously I'll vape anyway. I, I must have gone through so many vapes because like, I need to go outside to have a vape. In reality, I just made sure I hit my 12,000 steps every day. Oh, nice. <laughs> like, and this is it. Like At that point, I could have been like, do you know what? I'm going to go downstairs to this... Like, to, shop in the hospital or I'm gonna get a packet of hobnobs and I'm gonna eat my eat my like my feelings away. Like I've lost like I've lost out on prep. I'm not gonna compete now. But it's like no, because you're not gonna break me. You are not gonna beat me. Like even look like, I was talking to Sarah as a friend at the time and she was just like what the fuck? But like, fair play. My coach at the time was like 
I've never seen anyone do this. I come out of hospital, three pound down, leaner, and I was like, photo shoot next week, let's do it. And even with the photo shoot, like I went in, pulled the dressing off, did my own I got Bondi Sands tan, best tan ever. Like did my tan, pulled my dressing off, like, shoot, go. And that was it, like and if I hadn't gone through all of that, would I have necessarily had that mindset? Probably not. Yeah. But you've got to take positives from everything. And I'm not the most positive person. Not that, look, I'm an arse at times. Like I'm, a, I'm a complete dick. Look, I, I acknowledge that I'm a dickhead at times. But then it's knowing also that when I am a dick, I can make it better mm. because it will always be better. And I think that's the key to what anyone that's been abused or suffered trauma, whatever that is. Look, you have the power to make it better and you can make it better, but it's in your hands. And if you overcome it once, you can overcome anything if that was the worst thing that ever happened to you. If you can't at that point, I'm sorry, you don't deserve sympathy. You're just choosing to be a pussy. Like, you've got it in you. You've proved already once. Like, keep going because you will be rewarded in one way, shape or another. I think as well for for you, it's also that reflection of, you know, when you actually find your people and that's not against, you know, your, your previous partners and what happened there, but, you know, finding Tara, we've hit it off and it's like, you are attracting good people into your life. And there's a reason for that because we see you, we want to understand you and, and you see that and that's, you know, it's nice to, to actually then solidify that actually finding your true people that can carry a lot of weight as well because you don't feel alone. Like, we don't see each other all the time, right? We don't talk all the time. However, you know, when you do find those people, it's like, I know I could message you saying, I'm in the fucking shit here. Yeah. Sa same thing. And it does. It gives you an, a, another added strength as well, you know? Yeah. And that's the thing, like, trauma attracts. Yeah. But then within that, like, I think everyone that you've just mentioned has been through something in their life. I know. Sarah's had her bad points in life, like you have. Yeah. Who look? Obviously, we're here to talk about it now for a purpose. Yeah. But when do we blot about it? When do we? When do any of us play victim? Don't. And I think we all have to go through the point of being the victim. Look, all oh, is me. Look, I did in a very toxic way. I did, yeah. But then you come out of it like, well, yeah, well, I was a twat, and I can acknowledge that I was a twat. I acknowledge that I still can be a twat, not in the same way. But now I'm a better person for it because you have that self-awareness and you also have the strength to carry it through and be like, it's all good because it's going to be okay. And it is, it's, you know, when things happen day to day and stuff, again, Matt says this to me, he's like, why are you so blase about things? Like, and something quite big can happen. I'm like, it's all good. Like, you know, it, it is, it's going to be okay. Like, what's the worst that can happen? And I resonate with you, like, if I die, I die. Like, and I don't mean that as like, oh yeah, you know, I'm Billy Big Balls, but it's like the worst thing that can possibly happen to me is is death. And I know that the things that I've been through, they then nothing's gonna touch that. And it's just like, I don't know, it's there's an element as well we spoke about on the call where you can be a dangerous person. And again, that's not me saying, you know, I'm this or I'm that, but it's like you don't have anything to lose, do you, you know? But I think it works both ways. Like, there was a time in my life where what's the worst that could happen? It wouldn't be death. It would be going back to that. Mm, yeah, good point. Death yeah. would have been a lock up. Not to be suicidal, because I don't think that's the way forward or a way to deal with anything. Because you're just passing your pain on to other people that don't deserve it. Not to say that I ever deserve what I went through. Yeah. But I could potentially pass it on to people that aren't equipped to deal with that. Mm. Look, I remember, look, I overdosed once as a doorman. I was just, like, peeling out. So I was on, like, a, a, a weekend, basically, like, without a break. I must have done, like, three days and three nights without stopping. Got like, going from one venue to another. And I remember my niece, what year was that, 2014? She's 14 now, so... She'd have been like, what, six years old? Maths is right. And she phoned me up saying, Look, I love you, Uncle Lewis. But to hear that from a six year old, it's like, fuck. Like, so, like, at that point, then I'm like, something has to change in that perspective because 
I'd be passing on my pain to not that I, I overdosed intentionally as such, but I knew I was masking something. Yeah. But now I'm passing my pain on to a six year old. That's not fair. So it has to change. But then in the same breath, like, yeah, you're dangerous when you can't control your emotions, I think. Um, because, well, if you can't control your emotions, then where do your emotions take you? We all feel like killing people at times. Or we say we do, like, oh, we'll kill them or whatever. But in the same breath, like, I know, like, a lot, like, the majority of my clients will say, like, how compassionate I am with them in certain respects. Um, like, you know, like Molly, my client, who's like, she's like one of my best friends as well. Like, she's been through a prep this year. Like, we got a FitX Pro card. We got first at PCA. Like, she's had a hard year. If I hadn't been through everything that I've been through and learned to relate in some way, although, like, it's nothing similar in terms of the actual event, could I have been as compassionate and as kind as a coach to help her get to where she got through? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's the point where, like, like, I even got emotional when she got off stage because, like, I knew what it meant to her mm. and I knew that, like, I couldn't have helped her through certain things if I hadn't been through what I felt was my suffering to help her through her version of suffering to get her to that point and keep her on track. Mm. And the more you go through sometimes, the kinder you can be. Sure. But in the same breath, if I wanted to turn it on and I wanted to uh, that little inner child out, and you are the deadlift in front of me. Sorry, but you're not winning. Yeah, I totally agree with coaching as well. It's like, I don't know, I'm just not, I don't I don't want to bully people. I don't, I, I just want to help people excel and build a relationship and to be able to, because we're the teacher, aren't we? We're the guide and, you know, we're helping someone understand, educate and hopefully achieve their, their dreams or get them yeah. on that path. And I'm like, I just, you know, I don't, I don't want to have the anger there. I don't want to have the things no. that associated. I don't think it's, it's not always about winning. No. Like, the biggest win for me is being the better version of yourself. For sure. I cannot rate that enough. Whether, mate, like... whether it's in personal life, look, great, you got a pay rise of 2% this year. You're better than you were last year. Crack on. Yeah, you got, like, it doesn't matter, block place, block fuck places. Like, oh. I got first or second. Did you look better than last year? Did you, did you do everything you could? Yeah, you did. You've won. Like, I don't need six judges to tell you that you've won in your own perspective. Yeah, it's nice to get a trophy and we all compete to win, obviously. But in reality, it's that whole moment of like, it's like if you go to the pub with your friends, have a shot, I don't want a drink. Oh, you're a pussy, you're a dickhead or whatever. Like, go sit over there, you're lightweight. 20 minutes later, who's talking about the fact you didn't have a shot? No one. Yeah, you compete like, this is the best I've ever looked. Those pictures will last you a lifetime. Like, you know, you get on stage and you win a trophy. Yeah, like, PCA will do like, an amazing reel on Instagram where you'll get, like, 100,000 views. Great. Loads of likes, loads of new followers. In three months' time, say to the majority of those new followers, who's that person? Well, I don't know. Without showing them a visible picture of you, who's that person? I ain't got a clue who that is. But people don't care. But you will always be able to live with the fact that I I bettered myself. I and look better. Yeah, and that's what it might look. It's progress. Whether it's baby steps or giant steps, who cares? Progress is progress. When you step on the stage, you know, if you can feel that, this is what I try and, you know, put out on my social media, the podcast with my clients. It's like, if you see the progression in your physique, that's why I say, you know, get on the stage, fucking rock it. Like you have done that. That's you. Nobody else. Yes, the coach guides and, and what have you, but it's you that's done that. And it's like there's so much fulfillment in that. I've done, I've stepped on the stage and come forth and felt like I'd won because I'm like, I look sick, <laughs> you know. And it, yeah. it, there's something in that. And you can't help who turns up on the day anyway. Exactly. If someone's that's genetically cool. better than me, so what? Like, yeah, like, it's, it's like, we all want to win. Sure. Or I would, I would hope as a client, like, my client wants to win. Mm-hmm. Like, there are certain things, that, there's certain variables you just can't control. As long as you've nailed everything that you could control, what have you lost? 
doesn't make them a better person. They were just better for 10 minutes on one day in seven, eight, nine, ten people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. And we've all been there. Look, we've seen people get first one week and someone's got second. The week after, the person that got first got fourth and the person that got third got first. Very relevant. The panel's changed. Who cares? Like, it's irrelevant. Look, as long as you've progressed, as long as you look better, look, you're winning. And look, that's just what people need to understand. It's like progression. It's very personal. And you shouldn't rely on other people's validation to say that you're winning. As long as in your heart of hearts you know that you're winning. It's almost like that. It's like what's what's law and what is just. Like the law of the land at a show says that person got first, that person got second. Mm. Like, but what's what's morally right, what's morally correct? The fact that you look better than you've ever looked. They might not have progressed that much. They were just better on the day or already better or genetically more gifted or more enhanced, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, but you got the just victory. Because you're ten times better than you were last year, so what have you lost? And obviously, as coaches, like we can't sell that. Yeah. Like transformations look good, but we can't be like, well, we got the moral victory at every show. Where's your trophy? So oh, I've got none. Like it doesn't quite work like that. But in the same breath, in time, that will accumulate into trophies. If you can build the mindset of just keep getting better, at some point your day will come. Might not be tomorrow. Might not be next season. But at some point your day will come, and the victory will be even sweeter for it. And you're you're instilling the enjoyment of the process, right? Journey's always better than the destination. It's, it's so true. Like, and what we do as bodybuilders is every fucking day. Like, this isn't just like a oh, do that. You know, maybe genetic freaks aside, but essentially, you know, it is day in day out. And I feel like as well that you, you do miss out opportunities if you're not able to immerse in that. And also, you know, the place in it it holds. It's, it's a heavy weight, but very relevant what you said there. Nobody really cares days, weeks after it. And you've got those people, your people. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, we went to the Ray Street Rumble together, didn't we? Yeah. Can you remember who won figure? Christian's client. Well, that's a, that's a bit of a broad question because there's like a thousand bigger classes. But if I said to you, like, who won this or who won that or who won the overall, look, yeah, it was yeah. Nadia. It was Nadia, wasn't it? I think that won the yeah, overall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, who won what class? Look, unless it was Sarah's girl that won, like, you know, her figure class or Nadia because she's such like a presence on Instagram and stuff like that. Like, who were the other females that competed that day? Like in the segment that we watched, I don't fucking know. Mm-hmm. Who won bikini? I ain't got a fucking clue. Best moment of her life, maybe. I don't care, and I was there in the room. It's not that I don't care, but do you know what I mean? Look, I don't know because it's not relevant. But to her, it's like an achievement, and that's what I mean. Like, yeah, it's great for her, but and as long as she must have been better than she was last year, yeah, to get that level up. But for the people that got second, third, fourth, or fifth, or whatever, like, I don't remember her any more than I don't remember you. Like, unfortunately, does it mean you were? No, it doesn't. You're all on the same level. But as long as you progress, you've got your win. And that's it. So, you know, it's... I will add as well, the reason I remember Nadia is because she's a fucking epic human. Like, you know, when when you've got good people as well and you're seeing good people, whether they win, place, don't place, in my mind, they're still a good person. They're still a good athlete. Yeah, that's it. And I, I wouldn't, you know, people that didn't win that day, in my mind... They wouldn't be a, a lesser of a person or any of those things. And I've seen friends that have gone from no places. Well, me, me as well. And and then I've I've lifted winning trophies, but I'm still yeah. the same, I'm, I'm the same person, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So true though is when it when we transfer this into bodybuilding, it is like the thing is as well as you said with judging panels and, and what we do across different federations, all of these things that we see. It is something, again, I talk about the judges do not know your story. Like some people step on stage and they might have been in hospital. They might have lost their fucking parent. They might, loads of things can happen in a prep to you. And if we, if we associate everything you poured into that prep with just if you win, it's good enough. 
it's fucking savage post show. It's savage for your own value in yourself. And people don't, com sometimes people don't compete again because it, it's, it's very hard. There's a lot lying on it, you know? But it's the fact that you got there. Yeah. Literally. So having abs, um, how, what percentage of the population have got abs? Why? Because it's not easy to get abs. Take that 10 steps further. Like, oh yeah, you've got abs. A lot of people can have abs. You had shredded glutes. The percentage has diminished again, even more so. It's like, you don't understand how good you are. And again, like, I had a conversation with, like, I know she went, Mom, saying this, Molly, like, um, she's gone into an off season now just because, like, it was a very stressful prep. And obviously, I know we just thought, this is for the best. Let's just get growing, you know, get you into a good off season and come back. Like, you've got bigger goals than what's left to achieve this season. Let's finish on a high. Let's chase the bigger goal now. And there was a time, obviously, look, look, everyone should have offered, look, I failed, look, I should have done this, I should have done that. Look, look, A, you're a single mum with two children, toddlers as well, not easy, a full-time job, and you've completed a prep. And I had to kill her on this prep. Look, I'm talking like sub 800 calories and an hour and a half cardio a day because it was just what was required at the end. Um, and, you know, it's like you've done all of this a, you've done a prep. Most people couldn't do a prep. Yeah. You've gone on, you've done two shows, you've won, you know, you've got first place at both shows. Again, so the percentage of how good you are in comparison to the however many bikini short girls there are in this country, percentage has diminished again. Then you've gone into being competitive in both overalls, your percentage has gone down again, you're not just there to make up the numbers. And you've walked away with the X pro card. Whatever people think about the value of that pro card is fucking irrelevant to me. Like you've, you've, it's another achievement that you've made. You think about what level of percentile you are in the country compared to the majority of whether they're just first time a bikini girls right up to like the best amateur. You're in that top three percentile. Like this is how good you are. Why would you beat yourself up? Like there, yeah, it's a matter of perspective. We all want to be better. But don't beat yourself up. Use it to be like, well, I'll finish on a high. This is what I've achieved next season. Yeah, it hasn't necessarily finished the way I wanted it to. I could have gone on and done the FedEx finals or the PCI finals or whatever. Yeah, but now we're not doing that. So make next year better. As long as you keep progressing, who cares? Mm -hmm. Because, again, if I said to most people, who's this girl? I don't know. Oh, she's a FedEx pro. I don't know. Regardless of what, if it's an IFBB pro, people might get a bit more credibility. But even so, look, you've achieved something a lot of people haven't at whatever level. So look, just keep your head up and keep going. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, look, even with this podcast, in some ways, look, I know look, a lot of my clients are like, I've said to them, look, I'm on a podcast tonight, look, so I won't be on my phone, look, I won't be available tonight, sort of thing. A lot of them will probably watch it and they'll be like, now I understand why is it dickhead in my checking. <laughs> <laughs> or now I understand why his perspective is this. Or now I understand, like, it comes from a place of love. Not because I'm horrible, not because I'm a bully or whatever. Like, it's like, I know what I've come through to be the way I am. Whatever your hardship is or whatever your, you know, you perceive as like, the negatives in your life. It's not like I'm telling you to, like, get a grip. I yeah. just know you're good enough to overcome it, so. The difference. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. I know Massive. that. It's just perspective. Yeah, yeah. And it's teaching perspective as well at times. Like, it's certainly, I've gained a lot of credit and I, I guess credit's the right word. I don't know. I'm not very good at sort of complimenting myself as it were. But, you know, my clients see a lot in me sharing what's happened to me and it gives them strength. And that, to me, is a fucking gift because I'm like, you know, if I can share, as you've said today, you know, if we can share what we've been through and someone goes, wow, I can do a bit more here or I can keep going or I can be something or I can be someone or feel someone. It's like that that in itself. We we always said with doing this podcast, if we can help one person or one person to feel heard. It's always yeah. enough. It's always yeah, enough. 100%. Yeah. And look, it's quite for, like you sound about like about taking compliments and stuff or you like you know I can't take a compliment but Harley will say to me look oh you're amazing I'm like no I'm not look at best I'll roll my eyes whatever 
and he's like, you're part of it. Like, no, I'm not. But, like, not in a negative way. Yeah, same. Like, I'm, like I've got so many flaws as a person, but I wouldn't be your person if I didn't have my flaws. And everyone has a person. Like, embrace the shit that you've come through and the shit that, even, like, the negatives, as long as you don't punish someone from your, like, who's completely irrelevant for your past, or to your past, for your past. Like, if they love you, regardless of your flaws, embrace that and be better for it. And it's like, should we call you the best thing that's ever happened to me? Like, no, I'm not. Like, if you knew some of the, like, if you look at my relationship history, on paper, I'm the worst potential boyfriend ever. But, Give me five years. If you've stuck around through all my little straps and my little triggers and like my, you know, my twat moments, I will be the best thing that's happened because I will continue to get better for you, and I will work to be better. And now, even like, this is why I wouldn't change it because if I get a lift, I'm still like, yeah, it was a good lift. It's not good enough, but in a positive way because I want more for myself. Progress. Yeah, and like if you take that into relationships, into work, into business, how can you fail if something is never good enough in the right way? Mm-hmm. As long as you're not negative about it with yourself, <clears throat> it's that perspective of that's not good enough, I'm shit, or yeah, that was good, but now I want better. There's a difference. hundred, But it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And it's very much like if you've got a plant in the dark and you've got a plant in the sunlight, which one grows more? Yeah. Which one? Sunlight. No, the one you water the most. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So whether you've got negatives or positives, the one that's going to flourish is the one that you give your time to. Mm-mm-mm. Because you could look at like, the happiest people in the planet and they go nowhere. Some people are perfectly happy not achieving and they will go nowhere. It's like money. Yeah. But if you look at people like, with all the trauma in the world that are just really negative, they could be the most savage businessmen on the planet. And they will progress because they just water their plants in the right way. They just end up very unhappy in other aspects of life because of it. Mm-hmm. But like what you give attention to will grow. And if that is progression, you can't fail. No, I've never known anyone get up in the morning and say, oh, I tried my hardest and didn't get anything from it. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just the lesson that you learned because you didn't get what you wanted that day, you learned something from it, so therefore you took something from it. Yeah, it, it could be savage, like the, these, when we relate it to bodybuilding, some of the lessons you think, at the time, you know, it, it's, it's heart-wrenching, then you look back, right, and you're like, right, okay, I understand. You carry on, you carry on. Bodybuilding's for life, right, if you, if you want it to be. We can bodybuild till we we literally yeah. conk it, because it's there, you know, it's it's a lifestyle. But it's like, I would, ne- I would never compete again. Mm-hmm. I did like I did my first shit. I was like, you know what, fuck it. Look, I don't want to get on stage. Yeah. I'm going to do preps whenever I want to do a prep. I'm going to get shredded when I want to get shredded. A, because I love it. Because I'm good at it. But yeah. B, I'd rather do a photo shoot and put on a stupid clown mask or do some Halloween food. Which <laughs> Sarah's, down, Sarah's down for it anyway. She loves the idea. <laughs> but it's like... You just got to keep getting better within your life, however you, cho- whatever your lifestyle you choose, or however you choose to start do it, or whatever. Mm. Just like keep going and keep getting better, and like you'll find your niche, you'll find your circle, you'll find your friends, you'll find your loved ones, and you will end up happier because you just got to be true to yourself. If you think you're weird, be weird. If you think you're a freak, be a freak. If you, you know, if you just think you're boring but you're happy being boring, be boring because you will attract people that are the same mindset, and you will be happier. And, you know, like, don't punish yourself for your past. Because, like, obviously, like, obviously, like you said in the caption, I think, for this like, episode, like, you are not your past. You are what you make of it. So if you suffered, if it was difficult, if it was upsetting, if it was tragic, stick your middle finger up at it and be better and show whatever it was that you've come from that, yeah, thanks for that. So I remember there was a time, like, the house where all the abuse happened, um... After all the arrests were made, they sold that the house got sold and they've turned it into apartments. There was a time I couldn't sit outside that house. I used to drive up there sometimes. Like to make myself feel worse because I want to suffer. 
And I'd just sit out sort of down, I'd get upset. Like it was quite ironic because even on my wedding day, my what my ex wife, she chose the church that's next door to the house. When I say next door, I literally mean next door. And she didn't know. She didn't know about the abuse. So on my wedding day, I'm stood outside waiting for the cars to pull up and I'm just looking at this house. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, it's cool. Whereas now, like, I even messaged Andy a couple of, like, about a month or two after our last session. And I was like, I literally had the ability to drive up to that house, sit outside, because it's on, like, like a public area. And I just thought, thanks. Like I had the ability to just walk, sit outside in my car with a smile on my face, smile on my face, and be like, "Thank you," because I wouldn't be who I am now. And for as many people that hate me, there are people that love me, and that's what you've got to remember. Like I wouldn't have you if I wasn't me. I wouldn't have Sarah. I wouldn't have Hayley. I wouldn't have my clients. I wouldn't have my best friends. But I'd be a completely different person. So why would I change it? Yeah. And granted, we can all be better at certain things, but. Do I love myself? Not in an arrogant way, but of course I do. And if I could speak to that little boy now, yeah, I'd tell him it was going to be okay. Yeah, I'd tell him to fight harder. But I'd also tell him to stick with it. Knowing what I know now, stick with it. Don't run, stay. Because knowing what I know now and who I am now, I'm quite confident as a person anyway. Would I want to be different? Would I even want to remove that pain? No, I wouldn't. Stick with it because we're going to be good. And people will love us for who we turn into because of this moment right now. And I'm not saying anyone that's been abused or in that situation will stay in that situation or fight to get out of it. Obviously, they'll talk to people, don't hide. But whatever you're going through, even if it's like in this moment, there will be a day when you look back and you're like, whether it's to your abusive partner or your abusive parent or whatever, you're going to say to them, Look, in a way, thanks. Thanks and fuck you. Because you give me a power that you never knew you would. And I create... I don't see you as the victim. Yeah, yeah. I'm not the victim in this. But you're, you've are you got to live with whatever you did to me. You've got to live to, like, you know, molesting that 12-year-old boy. Now that 12-year-old boy is a 38-year-old man who's like, yeah, fuck you. And I'm saying it with a smile on my face. You will never have that power in life. I have. And I think that's key. How you frame it as well. Yeah. What a way to, to finish off. Although I do want to, I'm going to quote something you said when we had our phone call. Because it, it stayed with me and it's something that I value in, in myself. And to be able to connect with you where you said that I'm the type of person, if you are... In a hole, in a dark hole, oh, I'd yeah. come down with a toolbox or with, with the tools that we need. And I'd say, let's get out of this hole together. And if you find people in your life like, you know, what we have and true friends, you know, it does. You can, you can use that support if they're the right people. And it does help because we can often feel alone in these times. But finding your people, you know, it just there, there's nothing quite like it. And that's for me, that's probably the only time my darkness would come out if people fuck with my people that's a problem for me but, but other than that it's it's a caged animal you know yeah but even like it's a, it's a good asset to have yeah it's like again like let's go back to the emotional lifting like it's a good asset to have like i'll like, let the little boy out of the box or whatever and you know like it's made me a better bodybuilder for multiple reasons yeah. Doesn't mean I can go in and pull a world record tomorrow, but can I do something that's good for me? For great, that's great for me. Yeah, I can. And if I can do that every time, then just the nature of progressive overload. You're going to do it anyway, but if you can attach a purpose to it, you're going to do it even better. We're stubborn fuckers, aren't we? In the gym, we're just assholes. Yeah, we are assholes. <laughs> we what, found like, each other, so we're all right. I went down to um the shed to do legs with Sarah. I was like, I'm letting the little boy out. He got straight back in his box. She fucking killed him. <laughs> she, she annihilated me. He said to me about training once. I was like, Matt, Matt was winding me up. He was like, you can't fucking train with Sarah and Ramona. You're like a little pipsqueak. Nah, I, was, I, did, I did legs with Sarah and I was just like, fuck. Like, yeah, it, it, was, it was 
brutal at best. So like, the little boy got straight back in his box. I was like, I'm going for a nap. <laughs> I'm going to go for a nap and have some cocoa pops. Yeah, 100%. Now, <laughs> if anyone listens and whether that be a, a coaching inquiry or if someone wanted to talk to you about something we've we've spoken about today, is Instagram the best place? Yeah, my DMs are always open. Yeah. Any means that. Um, even, you know, people sharing and, and being able to share the episode and, and relate that's as we said you know if we if we resonate with one person that's always enough but um, like, going like, going back to school, even fuck coaching look like, it's just there like if you just want someone to talk to like unjudgmental yeah. it's there yeah yeah without the ulterior motive that can sometimes happen on social media i'd rather help someone out of a situation like that than get them pulled and put on stage like the two go hand in hand great but help is help yeah and just having that voice and of course thank you for trusting in me to obviously do this episode and i mean it when i say it's, it's something i'm very grateful for because i i know already that people are gonna take a lot from this and it takes courage to do that i know you're not going to take a compliment but i'm yeah. gonna say thank you we'll do another one and it will be better because this one wasn't good enough <laughs> You fucker. Well, I, I'm sure you will be back on at some point, but thank you so much, mate. All the love. No, no worries. Thank you. See you later. See you later.